so therefore we have to be a bit in, in line and in, in, and in uh, discipline. So this is the first kind of working session of this uh, conference uh, with the title Toward a Better EMU, Past Lessons and Structural Adjustments. And we have uh, two uh, very, very important and interesting uh, speakers invited for this. Uh, first uh, presentation will come from Mr. Uh, Louis de Melio. Uh, Mr. de Melio is uh, 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 leader, uh, uh, is the director of policy studies branch of the economics department of the OECD. So this uh, uh, policy <coughs> studies branch provides leadership and strategic direction uh, within the economics uh, department. And so, so we will be uh, very glad and interested to hear this uh, very important OECD message. If I may already also uh, to move to Peter Moslechner, I think no, no need to, to introduce uh, uh, Peter Moslechner uh, <coughs> here at, uh, uh, at, this, uh, at this conference. Uh, he had been a member of uh, the executive board of the Austin Central Bank now for quite a number of years before he had been the chief economist uh, of, our, uh, of our bank. Uh, and uh, he has ended his, uh, his term uh, just uh, two, days, two days ago. Uh, and so now he is already here with us as a free man so that he can, uh, uh, which might, uh, we will see whether it is, <laughs> It will be visible in his speech. Uh, I want to use this uh, occasion also uh, to welcome his successor, Mr. Peter Steiner, who is uh, uh, here also, also with us. And uh, there has been, I think, a very smooth process of uh, <coughs> transfer uh, from, uh, uh, from Peter to Thomas, <laughs> from uh, <coughs> Peter Mosley to Thomas Steiner. Uh, the fact that um, Peter Moslechner uh, is with us uh, is, I think, uh, proof for the old saying, once a central banker, always a central banker. Mm -hmm. So that means uh, the interest in this fascinating part of uh, uh, economic life is something that you carry with you. And uh, we all hope that uh, uh, you will share your knowledge and your interests with us also in the future, and we are glad that you have a good start <laughs> today for this. So now, first, uh, I'd like uh, to, to invite Mr. Demelio for his presentation. Thank you. Okay. Good, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues. Uh, I would like to start uh, by, by, by thanking Governor Novotny and the National Bank of, uh, of Austria for the invitation in cooperation with, uh, with, uh, with the sewer and Professor, Professor De Haan. Um, it, it's a great pleasure really to be, uh, to be here today. Uh, 20 years, it's, uh, 20 is a nice round number, one that, that gives us the opportunity not only to look at the future but also to take a stock of what, uh, what the past uh, has been like, what the achievements have been, uh, and then to ponder what's next, uh, what, uh, what can be done collectively to make sure uh, that, um, that uh, the Monetary and Economic Union of Europe um, can proceed uh, along the lines of the, of, uh, of the objectives that many of the previous speakers have, uh, have identified uh, already. Um, I think it's also interesting from a, from a personal perspective. I think all of us, I remember 20 years ago, I lived in the US in those days, and I remember coming to Europe on holidays the first time after the introduction of the euro and going to an ATM and seeing the euro, the physical euro, come out of the machine uh, for the first time. I think uh, it happened to many of us that uh, you probably found yourself in a moment of, of, of some trepidation, um, some emotion of, uh, of, the, of, of the meaningfulness uh, of that, uh, the, re the ramifications, the repercussions of all that um, for the uh, economics uh, of Europe, but also for the politics and, uh, and all the other aspects uh, that are so closely associated with, uh, with what we've been going through over the last uh, 20 years. Uh, a lot has been said uh, already, but uh, I thought I would uh, pick on one point um, that is about uh, growth and convergence uh, in the euro area. Of course, coming from the OECD, 
it will not come as a surprise to you uh, that I would focus on these uh, aspects of structural adjustment, structural reform uh, in the European uh, um, uh, countries. It's also true that uh, the Euro area, the European Union, and also the, uh, the, the advanced economies uh, more broadly, are going through this period of, uh, of, of a gradual, uh, long-lasting decline uh, in productivity growth, um, which reminds us of the need to, uh, to, to, to basically rekindle the impetus uh, for reform that would improve uh, the performance of our economies over the, over the longer time. Um, Another important issue, of course, but a lot has been said today in the interest of the time I will probably uh, skip from the presentation, are the issues related to resilience. Uh, we know that the outlook uh, for the euro area, for the advanced economies in general, um, is soft. So it brings to the fore all the discussions that we need to have uh, about how to better prepare uh, our economies uh, for, uh, for the vulnerabilities uh, that, uh, that may arise in the future, how to make them more, more resilient. So those two pillars, a long-term perspective on structural reform and, and, and economic performance, and a more cyclical uh, nature of a discussion uh, on resilience uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and performance over the business cycle. But let me focus now over the time that I have, uh, uh, that I have here over the next few minutes, uh, focusing more on that first part, the longer-term structural uh, growth-related uh, uh, aspects. Let me start, um, if I may, um, on the picture that uh, uh, Monsieur Trichet has already mentioned uh, uh, in his intervention in the morning about, uh, about the growth performance of the Euro area. If you compare um, the Euro area countries uh, in terms of uh, GDP per capita vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the top half of the OECD area, so the best performing countries in the OECD area, what is obvious from the picture is that there is still a lot of differences uh, in uh, living standards uh, among, uh, among the, Euro, the Euro area countries. We have countries like Luxembourg, which are basically, uh, that, that is basically almost 60% richer than the average uh, country in the top half of the OECD area. And you have the countries uh, at the far left end of the scale, uh, which are in the neighborhood of a 40 uh, or, or, or a third uh, percent less prosperous than the ones at the top, uh, at the top uh, half of the OECD. If you dig deeper into that and you decompose those gaps in uh, uh, GDP per capita into what can be attributed to labor productivity and to labor resource utilization, you also get a finer picture of what the main culprits are. And what comes up, what emerges from this simple decomposition is that a lot of the story is really about the differences in labor productivity much more than differences in resource utilization. I'll come back to resource utilization in a moment, but I wanted basically uh, to show you, to dig a bit deeper into the differences that still exist among uh, uh, the Euro area countries in terms of labor, labor productivity. Well, as we all know, uh, this gradual decline in labor productivity growth um, is, not, uh, is not new and it's not confined uh, to the Euro area or to the European uh, Union uh, as a whole. What we can see over time is that if you go from the blue bars uh, to the gray or red bars, we see that uh, over the last 30 years, labor productivity, if you take the EU as a whole, um, came down from just above 2% uh, per year in terms of rates of growth to uh, just a bit more than uh, half a percent uh, per year over the period since the, uh, the global economic and financial crisis. The same goes for the other advanced economies in the OECD area, but what is new really over the last uh, decade is that even the fast growing countries outside the OECD area are also experiencing this uh, uh, gradual decline in productivity growth uh, measured in terms of labor productivity. So with this preamble along about uh, uh, the general uh, trend in productivity decline, what's happening uh, in the Euro area countries? I think here what we can see from this graph, there is basically a very simple, simple convergence graph uh, in labor productivity. So comparing levels um, at the beginning uh, or at the turn of the century um, and average productivity growth, growth over the last uh, uh, 20 years or so, we see that basically there are two groups of countries that emerge uh, in the Euro area. A group um, that is basically the Central and Eastern European countries that have caught up, have grown, have had 
over the last 20 years rates of growth of productivity, labor productivity, uh, that are consistent with the story of convergence. And you have the southern European countries that have not basically uh, converged uh, on the basis of rates of change in labor productivity over, over this period of time. So what are the main reasons why? What are the culprits for this uh, failure uh, of a more general uh, convergence in productivity levels uh, in the euro area countries? Again, if we do a very simple decomposition and think of labor productivity as being decomposed into two components, one total factor productivity, another one capital deepening, so basically the stock of capital per unit of labor, what we see basically across uh, the euro area is that differentials in total factor productivity growth have really been the main, uh, the main uh, uh, reason uh, for this uh, very different performance in growth of labor productivity over the last, uh, the last 20 years. Uh, there are some cases, uh, the countries that I just mentioned before, the Central uh, and Eastern European countries, we can see clearly from the graph that in that case, growth in labor, factor, in labor productivity over the last 20 years has been helped by both increases, improvements in total factor productivity and further capital deepening in those countries. But the countries that haven't really, if you look again uh, at the far left of the chart, it is really the southern European countries, typically uh, where uh, performance has been uh, uh, very different in, in terms of uh, growth in total factor productivity. Even in the cases where there has been some capital deepening at the same time that have, um, to a certain extent, or at least in part, offset some of the poor performance in total factor uh, productivity that these countries uh, uh, may have had. So a story about uh, 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 remaining or persistent differentials uh, in living standards that can be traced back uh, to stories that have to do with the overall efficiency of economies, uh, overall uh, um, uh, allocation or reallocation of factors uh, in those economies uh, over the last, uh, the last uh, uh, 20 years. A word on factor utilization, so resor labor resource utilization that I mentioned at the beginning as well. If you remember that first slide with the decomposition showing that the bulk of the story was about uh, labor productivity, but there is some uh, 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 remaining uh, uh, differential in the utilization of labor um, in the euro area. And what we can see here is that if you just pick two groups where countries tend to be uh, very different in terms of labor force participation, not prime age individuals, uh, but if you took, take the older workers, uh, those between aged between uh, 55 and 64, uh, we see that there is already, uh, there is uh, also um, a lot of uh, discrepancies uh, in participation rates uh, among countries uh, with uh, typically the countries that are not catching up, essentially the southern European countries, uh, with uh, rates uh, of labor force participation that are below uh, the average of the OECD. So not only a story about productivity differentials, but also some scope for improving performance uh, via uh, policies that can increase the participation uh, of that group of workers. And why is it so important? Well, those countries are also facing uh, uh, demographic uh, changes and challenges uh, that would call for more efforts to bring older workers uh, into the labor supply as a way of improving, improving performance. Another group that is worth uh, mentioning is, is women, and then we see again that as in the case of older workers, uh, there is um, uh, considerable discrepancies uh, among the countries uh, in the labor force participation of women. There, if you look again at the countries that are not catching up, the picture is a bit more mixed. Uh, we have uh, Italy and Greece, for instance, with very low rates of uh, female labor force participation vis-a-vis -vis other OECD countries and the euro area countries, so fairly you know, below uh, the OECD average, but the other countries like Portugal and Spain uh, that are also not uh, uh, catching up, but have already managed to raise uh, labor force participation of women uh, to the level uh, that are to levels that are close to the um, to the OECD um, to OECD average. Well, this is basically to give you a picture of uh, the growth and convergence stories and the areas that come up or emerge from this type of decomposition exercise that point to the areas to the policy initiatives that would probably have the, uh, the greatest payoffs uh, in terms of uh, future structural reform. Uh, 
Let me also uh, say uh, a word about the single market, the completion of the single market. Uh, I don't need to spend too much time highlighting uh, the importance of this in the context of a monetary union. But there we see, again, um, a lot of differences across countries uh, in, the, in, in the euro area in the uh, regulations uh, of product markets. And we all know regulations of product markets um, the more pro-competition those regulatory settings are, uh, the better it is uh, for economic performance in general, for the performance of firms, for productivity growth, and, uh, and, and so on. And just to give you an example, in the case of one item of regulation of product markets, it has to do with the regulation of professional services. And then we see that although the EU countries, uh, more than the Eurozone, but the EU countries, um, have a level of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, regulation that is comparable uh, to the OECD area as a whole, there is huge discrepancies, uh, again, among the best performing countries, the ones that have regulatory settings for professional services that are more conducive to competition, and those, the last, the tallest bar there uh, on the right, uh, where this is, uh, this is not the case. Uh, we can also find other, this is on the base of the OECD indicator of product market regulations. There are a number of other uh, indicators uh, that are part of that uh, overall index that would point also to uh, the same picture of still considerable discrepancies across countries uh, in the euro area, in the European Union, even in uh, items where averages uh, are not so different from what we observe in the rest uh, of, the, uh, of the OECD. We've been saying that uh, and we've been you know, providing evidence uh, linking uh, product market regulations with firm level and sector level performance, as I, man as I mentioned uh, a week ago, and this, uh, a minute ago, or rather, and this is so important because we are seeing that uh, part of also the productivity story in the uh, European Union and in the OECD countries uh, as a whole has to do with a falling firm dynamism over time. So there is much less entry and exit of firms in the most dynamic markets in our economies than was the case a few years back. So if you think of productivity growth as a process of constant reallocation of resources, of gains in productivity and efficiency, um, a context or an economy where there is less dynamism uh, is one where productivity growth, or there will be much less room for productivity growth uh, arising from the uh, influence that the entrants have uh, in the performance of firms in a specific uh, sector. But let me also have, say a word about exit. Uh, if one looks at insolvency regimes uh, across countries in the European Union, the Euro area, even across uh, the OECD uh, area as a whole, there is still a lot of differences uh, in regulatory settings, not only in terms of uh, barriers to restructuring of firms, but also uh, mechanisms for prevention and streamlining, for mechanisms and procedures for discharge in the case of insolvent uh, uh, firms, and also uh, considerable differences in the costs associated with insolvency. These bars obviously represent the state of legislation in individual countries. If one adds to this, which is the relevant point in the case of a, of a monetary union, uh, the additional costs associated with cross-border uh, insolvency procedures, uh, we see that that adds not only in terms of the burden of, of, of procedures for insolvency, but also the costs associated with that. Well, I mentioned a minute ago the issue of firm dynamism. Dynamism is not only about entry, it's also about exit. And what we see also is that there is plenty of evidence linking the nature, the provisions of insolvency regimes, uh, to the speed and ease uh, with which firms exit markets. So a lot of the evidence that we see on capital being stranded in sectors or activities uh, that are not performing um, uh, can be traced to differences across countries uh, in insolvency regimes. So I just wanted to add this element to the story because building a common market is not only about streamlining, facilitating transactions uh, at the cross-country level, but also working on domestic legislation that can uh, contribute to greater competitiveness or competitive forces in domestic markets and facilitate uh, the reallocation of, uh, of assets and capital uh, to activities that are more, uh, that are more, uh, uh, or, or have, a, have a greater potential uh, for productivity development. 
I have a few other slides that are focusing more on the issue of resilience, uh, but uh, I'm sure these topics will come up in the discussions. They've been introduced before, so I will, I will skip that. I would just like to, to show one chart that I'm borrowing here from the Commission, which I find extremely uh, interesting as an illustration of risk sharing uh, uh, among the euro area uh, uh, countries, or within the euro area if you want, um, relative to the, uh, uh, to the United States, for instance, as a benchmark for that, uh, for, that, uh, for that comparison. And much has been said about this, so if you allow me, I'll probably skip these last uh, few, the next few slides and go to, um, uh, to the issues that have to do with then what to do, uh, since the objective of this conference is not only to look at the last 20 years, but to point to directions uh, for the future. Let me show you, uh, to, to illustrate this, uh, the case of structural reforms uh, to boost productivity growth in the euro area countries, and at the same time increase labor force uh, participation or improve resource utilization uh, in, the, in the common currency area. These indicators are based on the work that the OECD does in basically documenting uh, the efforts, the initiatives that countries put in place over time to address recommendations uh, to improve uh, their economic performance, focusing on those two aspects, better resource utilization and, uh, and, and stronger productivity growth. What we see, and again, if you compare those two groups of countries that I mentioned at the beginning, the ones that are really catching up and the ones that are not, what one sees is that on the chart on the right is that the countries that are uh, catching up, essentially the Central and Eastern European countries, they have been investing much more uh, relative to the other groups uh, on policies that have, uh, or policies targeting or aimed at improvements in labor, um, in labor productivity. Um, the charts are pointing south, uh, which is uh, one feature of structural reforms that we've been documenting and mentioning uh, uh, over time, is that there is indeed uh, less impetus from reform now than was the case around the period of the crisis. It doesn't mean that countries are doing less now than they used to before the crisis, but there was, of course, given the need, the severity of the crisis and the challenges that it exposed uh, to accelerate the pace of reform. And that explains these peaks uh, in the lines. This is not a situation that is unique to the uh, euro area. We see that throughout the OECD um, area as a whole. But what is interesting to see, I think, comparing those two charts, is that the countries that are catching up are the ones that have really been invested or invested heavily uh, in the past on policies that can improve uh, uh, productivity growth. These is essentially reform uh, priorities and reform action at the national level. What can be said about uh, reform priorities uh, at, the, uh, at the European level, those that have really a more cross-border uh, 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 feature or nature? I mean, just one graph to show you that uh, you know, the first one presented the situation over the last 15 years. Uh, what we are seeing now is that the picture is not changing much if one looks at reforms that are in the pipeline in countries for 2019 and 2020. For those of you familiar with the, uh, the going for growth exercise of the OECD, this is the type of benchmarking and monitoring uh, 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 performance uh, responsiveness in, in countries. But let's look at also the other, perform, the other reforms that really have a more uh, a clear cross-border uh, cross nature. And then there are a number of, uh, of, of, uh, of elements that that uh, elements there that need uh, to be highlighted. For instance, uh, efforts to address barriers in the business sector through simplified administrative formality. The Commission is working on several aspects related to that as well, but we see as areas uh, for that have enormous potential for improving uh, the uh, state of uh, regulation in product markets across the euro area uh, countries. Also issues related to energy, cooperation through better power system operation and trade, and other areas related also to digital skill uh, needs. Uh, it was already said uh, earlier on in the morning that the need to better prepare the European countries for the digital transformation that is, uh, uh, that is uh, taking place in our economies.
I will also skip the next few slides because they are the ones uh, that have to do more with the resilience aspects. Um, I think there is no need to, to recap some of the elements that have already been mentioned uh, um, in, in the morning, um, but I'm sure they will come up during the day and maybe even during the exchanges uh, over the next few minutes. But I'd like to thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to share some of these thoughts, some of the, uh, uh, the, the analysis and the areas uh, for uh, future uh, reform that could improve the longer term performance uh, of the euro area uh, economies. Thank you very much. Thanks again, Governor, for the time. Thank you very much, Mr. Demelio. I think this was uh, an overview of the re real side of the economy, and now we come to the monetary side, uh, and uh, with a very knowledgeable presentation on this. Please, Peter. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation, and thanks, Ewald, for the much too kind words of introduction. Having uh, contributed to the organization and the design of this conference for more than 20 years, it's a little bit a different perspective for me today. But uh, on the other hand, this uh, 20 years um, coincide uh, rather perfectly with the first 20 years of the, of the Euro. And this gives me a perfect opportunity to review uh, the developments uh, over this period. And as I had said, uh, from a monetary policy side, which complements, uh, I think, nicely what Louis has uh, presented in a very fascinating, very fascinating way. If you are asking for the most simple timeline of uh, EMU, here you have it. Um, we had 10 uh, beginning years, which are the golden years. Most of them are triche years when the time was uh, in very good shape. Um, you see at the bottom of the uh, left column, um, you, you can't even see it, but uh, this was uh, HICP development and uh, Jean-Claude always was very proud during the press conferences to point at uh, to which extent the objective was fulfilled at 1.93 or 1.87 on average since the start of uh, monetary union and this was right, perfectly right. Uh, for this point in time. On the other hand, in the second column, you see the second part of the first 20 years, the crisis first and the crisis mode afterwards. And uh, the critical thing is that we were not able to leave the crisis mode uh, since then. But that's not enough. I think uh, what needs to be added is, and that's in the title of the conference uh, as well, is on the right hand side, the future. Where do we go? And I think also it's very important, and I will say a few words on this, uh, to add the preparatory phase, what had happened before we entered into monetary union, because many things which were decided uh, at this point in time uh, turn out to be uh, rather significant what has happened over the last years and what will perhaps be also once again be discussed in the near future. Obviously, the pending challenge uh, at the moment is the axis from the crisis mode. I will not talk about, because it's too difficult for me to the governors and the governing council, about when and how to exit. I will address more the long-term view, so to say, where to exit. Because in the end, we all hope that uh, at some point in the future, we will achieve a situation which we can call uh, the new normal. By the way, do you think, do you know what the Europeans um, think about the future? There was an interesting study of Bertelsmann Stiftung uh, last year, which tells us that 67% of uh, EU 28 population thinks that the past was a better place to live in. And more than 70% in the age groups uh, over 35. Difficult to understand, but one explanation they give is that nostalgia provides uh, stability in moments of uncertainty, and obviously there was a lot of uncertainty over the uh, last years. And this means that uh, we Europeans think more in the world of uh, Stefan Zweig, who for good reasons uh, in 1942 uh, wrote about the golden age of security before 
the First World War and in particular also before the Second World War. But I think it's much more important when looking into the future to see what uh, Yuval Harari has written, that we don't know how the world will look like in 2050, but what we know for sure is that it will be completely different from the one we are used to today. And I think that's the right approach to tackle future issues. So what I will try to do is uh, to point very quickly on how monetary policy making has changed. I will also say two words on the preparatory phase and then more or less conclude with what to expect for, from the future new normal of monetary policy. How monetary policy has changed, you know that all the central banks have reacted in a very, very similar way, with one exception, that's the, the uh, red uh, line you see on top here, that was the People's Bank of China, but there were different framework conditions, obviously, in China. But in the table on the right-hand side, see the, you see that all the big central banks has more or less taken the same measures uh, to tackle the crisis. This has taken place uh, also in a significantly changing environment. I would mention only two things, uh, structurally low inflation, we are still in this situation, but also this uh, constant low interest rate environment we are not able to escape from. All this together has resulted in significant changes in monetary policy implementation and operation, and uh, most of the public discussion on monetary policy concentrates on this. Follow me on a short uh, experiment on uh, 20 years of EMU in four pictures. When you compare the first 10 years, more or less, and the second 10 years, then you can see how different the world is and in which way the world has changed. On ECB policy rates, you see uh, more or less textbook steering by small variation in interest rates on the left side. And on the right side, you see what has happened. Uh, policy rates brought down uh, at an enormous uh, pace uh, and now anchored even below the zero lower bound. On liquidity provision, it's the same, almost invisible liquidity provision from nowadays perspective. In the first 10 years, even in times of Lehman Brothers, there was a uh, as you said, enormous uh, difficult decisions to make, but compared to what we have nowadays, and you see on the right-hand side, was nothing uh, in terms of volume. There were also a lot of structural changes in ECB tender operations. Uh, normal tender operations with the dominance of the weekly tender in the first 10 years, and on the right-hand side, you see that almost all tender operations are targeted long-term tenders no short-term provision of liquidity anymore. Doesn't really work. Yeah, that's the future. No, it's good. <laughs> that's even the present. <laughs> so what you see is, uh, and that's uh, perfectly known, is that uh, in this last decade, uh, the quantitative easing European style has uh, taken over all uh, the volume of liquidity provision we have done in the past. That's only a reminder that you see what in detail the measures taken were. And I will only say two words on this, in, from my point of view, important role uh, of the preparatory phase. In the preparatory phase, many decisions had to be made. The ECB was the youngest, and still is, the youngest central bank, so the most modern design uh, was uh, given to this new institution in terms of mandate, in terms of instrument, and this was also uh, reflected in the evaluation of its strategy done in 2003. So you have uh, everything what was in the academic literature at the time, you have here uh, in the design of the ECB, independence, price stability, mandate, short-term interest setting, uh, market-oriented policy, not common before, say in the old normal of monetary policy, uh, before the ECB was created. And this was also then shadowed in the principles for 
monetary policy operations, in particular market principles and the harmonization of instruments. And in this respect, um, it's important to remember that when these decisions were made, uh, they were not only the later participants in EMU, we were sitting around the table, but we had to negotiate also with the UK, with Sweden, uh, with Denmark, Greece was not that important, which from the beginning on didn't want to join uh, the euro area, but had a big say in the negotiations. And in this uh, monetary policy subcommittee, uh, where I had the privilege to participate, these countries had an important influence on how the instruments were defined and uh, what the important instrument from their point of view were. And if you look at the table of uh, policy instruments defined at the time, uh, you see really that there was a sort of cultural compromise uh, necessary because what you can read in this table, and this table comes from 1998, for example, is outright transactions. These outright transactions were already there, not only created uh, in the crisis situation uh, when uh, we introduced the asset purchase program. No, because of the influence from coming from the UK, who for historical, from historical traditions always did these outright purchases, they were also introduced into the definition of policy instruments uh, for the ECB and the euro area. So what to expect for a future new normal of monetary policy? Very quickly, to leave some um, time for discussion, I will go into three areas, uh, interested policy, liquidity provision, and forward guidance, but I give a clear product warning. Uh, tomorrow, Ulrich Bienzeil uh, will be with us. He would be able to uh, talk about each of uh, the issues for days, if not years. Uh, so uh, each and every slide I will now present to you would be around an own lecture, an own deep discussion of its issues. First, interest rate policy. It's clear that in the aftermath of the crisis and what has happened in monetary policy, the zero lower bound was newly defined. It's no longer at zero, it's somewhere below. Second, interest rate policy is no longer the simple textbook model of uh, monetary policy. This no longer applies. But the transmission process of monetary policy has become much more complicated. And this much more complicated and diverse different transmission processes are also used by monetary policy nowadays. Fourth, um, completely unsinkable before the crisis, interest rate policy is now trying to steer the entire term structure of the yield curve. Previously, it was, uh, I think, the holy uh, great grain of, of, of a monetary policy only to uh, steer short-term rates, and all the other things will be done by the market. This has changed completely, not last because of the asset purchase program. Five, um, acting in a structural liquidity surplus uh, situation for a very long time has introduced a movement from the previous corridor system where the main refinancing rate uh, was the one who really gave the monetary policy signal to a floor system where now the negative deposit facility rate steers the whole exercise. Six, uh, liquidity provision has completely changed from in the old normal providing peak liquidity only, small amounts of peak liquidity and the distribution of liquidity is done then by the money markets and by the money market participants to a permanent, very high volume of central bank liquidity. And one of the reasons uh, for this you see in the graph, the unsecured money market still up to now simply has disappeared. There's still much uh, risk aversion in the market, so uh, banks no longer give each other money on unsecured terms. Seven, balance sheet size, you know, all know about this. Balance sheet size has become 
an accepted monetary policy instrument and is used by the Fed, by the ECB, and many other uh, banks uh, at the same time. Eight, you see in the graph that historically, and this graph comes from December 2006, in the Euro system and in the Federal Reserve and in the uh, Swiss National Bank, liquidity provision was quite different. It came from different sources. In the US, it always came from what we in Europe call asset purchases from Virgin Treasury bills. In Europe, it came mainly from repo operations. This has changed in the course of the crisis, and what we see is an harmonization uh, of operational traditions in central banks all over the world. Eight, there's a significant longer maturity of central bank liquidity nowadays. When you look at the present situation from the beginning of this year, almost all is long-term liquidity uh, provided by the central bank, in this case by the ECB, less than six billion out of more than 2,000 billion is what we usually did as uh, the main refinancing operation and the weekly tender. 10, forward guidance was uh, added in an explicit way, so talking to the markets and influencing expectation have become important uh, monetary policy instrument. I took the example of the press conference uh, of Marie Dagi from the 7th of March. You have it, uh, you have the whole uh, portfolio of uh, forward guidance here, forward guidance on interest rates, how future interest rates uh, how future policy might develop on reinvestment policy, on long-term financing operation like the newly started TLT-03, and on FRFA, fixed rate full allotment. Please keep in mind that since October 2008, there are no tender operations anymore. Every bank gets as much liquidity as it wants at a fixed rate as long as uh, the bank is able to provide uh, enough collateral to get this liquidity. Completely different from the old normal we were used to and which is still represented in the textbook we use. 11 and last, forward guidance, how successful or how damaging may or will it be? You have um, Bernanke's paper Trantrum on the left-hand side where over a few days uh, the long-term interest rates uh, in the US jumped by more than 100 basis points because of, let's say it in general terms, wrong forward guidance or mistaken messages given to the markets. And on the other hand, an interesting uh, actual uh, situation based on the famous Fed dots, the FOMC dots you see that the policymakers are still signaling that interest rates may rise over the forthcoming years. The market expectations you see in this uh, red and orange lines uh, down there, the market expectations uh, think that interest rates might even fall over the forthcoming years. Also illustrating this a very difficult situation, how to use forward guidance efficiently to get the outcome uh, you want to have for monetary policy. Are there any conclusions? At least I have some personal conclusions. I'm more in the Harari camp. I think uh, the future new norm of monetary policy will uh, very likely look very different from the normal we are used to from the past. I expect that all these uh, instruments and measures uh, we have uh, done in the course in the aftermath of the crisis uh, will stay with, up, with us. So in the definition of a new normal, all these instruments will be there. Of course, they will not be used in the same way and in the same intensity uh, all the time, but they will remain in the toolkit and they also will be regularly used uh, if necessary and appropriate. The important question is when will this new normal uh, be achieved. Uh, unfortunately, given latest developments, we are far from this situation when we'll be able to define this new normal and to enter it. And this is a very unfortunate situation, uh, even more than a decade after monetary policy went into crisis. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, this is, uh, <laughs> I think, a good example that once a central banker, always a central banker. So <laughs> we hope that uh, uh, we can share with you uh, your views also very much in the future. Uh, I think we have had two really fascinating presentations, and both of both presentations, I think, showed that uh, uh, if you are on your daily on your daily life, you tend to underestimate the amount of change that we s experience in medium term. And this is really remarkable, and, uh, and I <laughs> agree, because change will also happen in the future. In fact, I think uh, this is, was a bit of a uh, kind of side uh, aspect of this, of this uh, conference. We, we have to expect that central banks uh, will uh, engage in a kind of strategic review after some time. The the Fed has already started this strategic review. Uh, I think it would make just sense for the, e for the ECB after 20 years to have some kind of strategic review. So I think what we just have here could be uh, very important inputs exactly in these kind of uh, discussions. So now, thanks to the discipline of both speakers, we have time uh, for a discussion of the audience. I open the floor. Uh, I would ask everybody to give the name and affiliation, and there are micros just around. There is one. Good morning. Uh, Jorgos Makedonis from uh, Queen Mary University of London. I would like to ask uh, your thoughts on this question. Uh, responsibility of uh, central banks and climate change environment. Okay, further, further questions? Is this? No. <laughs> Please, Mr. Wolf. Oh, so, sorry, sorry. First lady and then, so, yeah. Thank you so much. I have a question. How much influence can central banks, now that you've done your good job, help with fiscal policy and workforce education? Thank you. Mr. Wolf? Um, it's a question predominantly for uh, Mr. Muslechner. I enjoyed his presentation very much. It's very complimentary to what I'll be saying after lunch. The question is perhaps too difficult to answer, but since you are now retired, you can try, which is <laughs> what on earth do you think the ECB could now do if there were, if there were a significant... Question to the governor. No, no, it's a question to you. <laughs> the governor can't answer. Uh, <laughs> If there were a significant recession, what are the policy, realistic policy options for a monetary policy institution in the Eurozone in current circumstances? Okay, thank you. So I think we have three pertinent questions. Uh, perhaps uh, climate change is also something that uh, uh, is reflected with OECD. Perhaps if you could start, and then I would move over to Peter Mosler. Please. Well, perhaps to, to the uh, question on climate change. Ra rather than focusing on what central banks could do, I think that will leave the, the question to a central banker to answer. But obviously what we are looking at, climate change is one of the challenges that our economies and the world is going to be facing, so it's, or is facing. So what we are looking at in terms of climate change is you know, what impact does it have or what impact the environmental issues in general have on productivity, for instance, what impact does it have on the performance of our economies, over and above uh, preparedness for the changing climate, preparedness for risks uh, associated with that. And recent work that we've done shows that, you know, as you can imagine, the difficulties of dealing with reverse causality and links between environmental degradation or any indicator of environmental degradation and productivity, I mean, those challenges are huge methodologically. But we are seeing growing evidence that uh, Productivity of firms tends to be lower in areas where the environment is more degraded. What's the implication of that? Is that we are seeing a link that goes beyond all the other aspects of, uh, of climate change that one can think of, that links directly uh, concerns about the future growth of our economies on the basis of productivity, on the basis of performance of firms. You're going to tell me, is it a very narrow perspective on it? Uh, it is one that is narrow, but it's one that requires uh, significant work, significant solid evidence, uh, so that we can have a narrative around climate change, around protection of the environment, uh, that is centered on performance and on growth of our economies moving forward. 
roles of central banks. Again, I'll probably a central banker is better prepared for that. Uh, but given the nature of climate change, how it cuts across different policy areas, uh, it's very hard to think of strategies that would not be whole of government in general, that would not involve all the significant act actors of society. From our point of view, already establishing a link that is statistically solid uh, between performance and between uh, indicators of quality of the environment is already, uh, in my view, uh, an important step forward. May I perhaps mm. add a bit of a <laughs> provocative uh, aspect? You were very much advocating a kind of uh, de facto deregulation of product markets, more or less American style. This mm. is basically the model you, you showed here. Isn't this uh, getting into very uh, uh, difficult uh, uh, policy conflicts with uh, aspects of climate uh, change? Because that would mean in many cases perhaps not a deregulation, but a re-regulation. No, indeed, governors, that, that's a, an important point, and thank, thanks for raising it. Because when we are talking about uh, 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 reforming product market regulation, it doesn't mean deregulating markets. You know, there, there, is, there are several areas that we know where regulation is important. Addressing market failures is one of them. Addressing environmental concerns, of addressing other, where regulation is important. So uh, the indicators that are used are the ones that basically try to measure how pro-competition regulations are in network industries, in professional services, in, 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 in the markets for goods and services in general. But what we are seeing at the same time is that, well, we still need regulation uh, that would be, for instance, take uh, uh, in the case of network industries, uh, you needed to have regulation of access to infrastructures. In the digital area, we still need the regulation in so many areas that would allow uh, uh, protection of, uh, of, 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 of personal data, for instance, that would access, uh, that would uh, uh, regulate access uh, to data in general in, an, in economies that will be extremely uh, or more and more data driven. So I would like to make this distinction that uh, uh, the aspects of regulation uh, that I was talking about are the ones that have to do with improving competitive forces uh, in product markets while, while recognizing that there are so many other areas uh, of economic activity that will need to be regulated still for the reasons that, uh, uh, that I mentioned. So thanks for the opportunity to clarify that. So coming back home to monetary policy. <laughs> Very quickly on the, on, the, on the three questions raised. Um, climate change, um, obviously there are a lot of initiatives around at the moment linking climate change to the financial market situation and financial market institutions. That's also the case uh, with central banks. Uh, there was a, a central bank network where also uh, uh, sovereign wealth funds and regulators are participating, set up uh, last year, and we're also participating on the, this. I think there is nothing uh, to say against analyzing the situation also from the central bank perspective and also analyzing what the central bank does from this perspective. But in the end, it uh, has to be taken into account what are the objectives of central bank policy. And when you, for example, take the asset purchase program of the ECB as one example, then uh, we are buying government bonds. So in the end, the climate change input then is with the government spending this money, which are bought or enshrined in the bonds we, we are buying. And that's similar for all the other instruments we have on the balance sheet. When it become, comes to liquidity provision to the banking system, obviously it's with the decision on loans uh, by the commercial banks, then what the climate change input of this might be. Second, uh, Susan, on, on central bank fiscal policy and, and, and lifetime education, I think uh, this is a very difficult issue I would interpret it more in the way to say, of course, what we will see, in particular also in a situation where new necessities for expansionary policies uh, will show up, uh, is the question of the policy mix. How much can a central bank then, given the situation we are in at the moment, then contribute to, this, uh, to overcome this situation compared to other policies. It's nice to hear uh, our Minister of Finance, all the good ideas he has, but in the end he has also a responsibility 
to react with fiscal policy if things uh, get worse. And I think that is um, the important point at that time when we see that new policy measures are necessary. What can the ECB do? That's the most provocative question, I think, in this respect. I would try to answer it in the following way. What I, in my presentation, tried to show is that we have acquired a whole portfolio of new instruments, which were always there and used in the US, for example, and in other places, but they were quite uncommon, with the exception of the UK, for continental Europe, yes. Now we have introduced this, this is in the portfolio of instruments and it can be used. If it's possible to use them, depends on the decision-making process uh, in the governing council in the end and also on the political discussion uh, surrounding this. I would not say that we don't have uh, any room for maneuver anymore because these instruments are there. If they will be used and if they in the end are effective is another question too difficult for me to answer. <laughs> I fully agree with Peter, but I want also to remind you what uh, Mario Draghi and many of us always uh, underlining. Uh, one should not overburden monetary policy and uh, ECB should not be the only game in town. So I think one should really see this in a bigger context. We have a new round. Mr. Rubik, please. But perhaps if you, to, to introduce yourself, Mr. Rubik is a member of the uh, European Parliament. My name is uh, Paul Rubik, member of the European Parliament uh, Budget Committee. Uh, my question is about the uh, Chinese Central Bank and the Belt Road Initiative. How do you think uh, the Chinese uh, will act on the financial market to support this uh, initiative from the government? And uh, what do you think we can do uh, to get uh, approximately the same growth rates? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> we have a, a new round of questions. So there are one, two, please. Karl Bichelmann, your European Commission. Uh, my question is on the implementation of structural reforms. Uh, I think, I mean, both in the OECD going for growth exercise, but also in our own exercise of, uh, of the, in the context of the European semester, we see uh, in reform fatigue, reform resistance, uh, if not outright reform reversals uh, in some countries. Uh, and, uh, and the question is, I mean, how to, to deal with that? And, uh, and I think one reason is that uh, reforms, I mean, have re acquired a rather bad reputation in, in past years. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, reform is a five-letter word, but uh, it, it almost has the connotation of a four-letter word uh, uh, these days. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I think, uh, I mean, that has to do a bit with uh, that reforms are often perceived as, as bringing torture and pain, but no positive benefits. Uh, and uh, uh, so we have tried to, to address this, I mean, via various ways, I mean, and I mean, not least main trying to mainstream the inclusiveness uh, uh, of the process uh, into our policy design. Uh, and my question, I guess, I mean, for uh, Mr. De Mello would do, uh, I mean, what kind of uh, incentive devising, packaging, uh, say, political process could you envisage, I mean, to, to, to foster and support uh, the, ref the implementation of reforms? Thank you. I think I've seen Professor Socher. Yeah, please. Karl Socher from the University of Innsbruck. I missed one question and one factor which caused the differences and the crisis in Greece and now in, in Italy. That is the lack of flexibility of prices and wages. If there would be more flexibility then the crisis in Greece and Italy could have been avoided. <laughs> 
Thank you. We have room for one, f one. F there is one question back there. Okay. Franz Nauschnick, uh, until recently Austrian Central Bank. Oh. <laughs> Uh, my question is, uh, uh, this question of uh, uh, monetary policy has done a lot, but we have not done a lot with uh, fiscal policy. So couldn't fiscal policy be more active? For example, I've been in the German expert group on uh, infrastructure financing of the government, and we have a problem we, uh, where uh, fiscal budget is quite okay, but where infrastructure is lousy. So investing more in infrastructure it's, uh, would help. Uh, them, it would help everybody. And uh, if, if we compare a bit to China, in Europe we have a dance, we have always programs, but they are not financed, they are not built. We ju it's just programs, the Chinese were built. And uh, if we do more in infrastructure, this would help enormously. Thank you, and Jean-Claude says. Thank you very much. I, it was indeed uh, extremely stimulating and uh, fascinating, and I took a lot of pictures of your slides, <laughs> <laughs> if I can. Uh, I have a, a question for Peter. Uh, you mentioned very often uh, that all central banks of the advanced economy were more or less put in the same situation, with uh, an extraordinary environment, uh, the obligation to be non-conventional in their uh, behavior, and uh, with the, the likelihood that the, they will more or less at a time go towards a new normal, which is still unknown. Uh, what difference would you make in this respect between uh, ourselves, the US, Japan, not to speak of other advanced economy, and do you expect that the new normal will not be the same for the various advanced economy? Thank you. So if we... I invite sure. you also to start. Okay. Th thanks, Governor. I, if you allow me, I'll, I'll probably focus on, on Carl's question because this is a fascinating topic that, uh, that we've been thinking a lot about. It's basically the political economy of reform. Yeah. Then the political economy of reform, I think there are two basic questions there. Uh, why is it that some reforms are so difficult to implement even though we all know that they are important uh, and that in the end they will improve people's quality of life? The other question is, why is it that there are some reforms, that why is it that the same reform may be so difficult in country A when it is not in country B? So I think understanding that is part of the story. What we've observed over the years in looking at the, uh, the, the, factor, the factors that, that, that help the implementation of reform, I mean, there are a number of elements there, but basically three of them that I would highlight. One is a good narrative. I mean, that's the political, in the political sphere. I mean, how is it that you package, as you mentioned, Carl, but how is it that you communicate that in a way that would uh, uh, muster the necessary support in the quarters of society that would be one, either most affected by it or potentially the best supporters of that. So that's one. So narratives and communication. The other one is political leadership. You know, how is it that you, you, that you take upon yourself as a government to basically face some of the challenges that may be the most pressing uh, in your country and how, and how you go about uh, the political pr process to make sure that those reforms come to fruition. And another one is complementary policies so that in this narrative and in this communication you have packages so that uh, you can diffuse the gains sometimes, you can compensate the losers, you make sure that you build uh, coalitions for reform that are as diffused and are as, as balanced, if you want, as possible. Uh, I would say that those are the key, basic, broad elements uh, of the political economy considerations there. Let me, it's obviously easier said than done. It depends on the specifics of different realities, points in time, and so on. How can we, how, how are we basically helping in that respect? Well, 10 years ago, we were talking about evidence on impacts of reforms that were looking at average situations in countries. So it was basically how it was affecting the average or the median household and so on. We've been working much more on the distributional effects of policies. So it's going beyond, so that we are saying that certain elements of product market reforms that can affect GDP, growth in GDP per capita, but now we are saying, well, how is it affecting not only growth in GDP per capita, but also household disposable income in different segments of the, 
of the, uh, uh, of the distribution. Why is it important? Because it helps countries, it helps governments build these narratives around, uh, around, uh, uh, around reforms, identifying groups that would need compensatory uh, uh, policies uh, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to face the situation, or at least a transition uh, in that. And what we are doing more and more also is to look not only, that ties in with the question from, from the gentleman from uh, Queen Mary, uh, to look also at the environmental impacts of some of these reforms. So from our standpoint, this is a way of helping with the narrative, it's a way with helping with the evidence base, but then the political economy is obviously much more complex uh, than that. No? Yeah. Thank Thanks. You. First, perhaps on, on Paul Rubi's question on People Think of China. When I last visited People Think of China in, in autumn uh, last year, then we discussed all these uh, Rosen Belt Initiative issues also. My impression was that as every public institution in China, People's Bank obviously is supporting this uh, in communication, in words, and in everything. But there's not so much of People's Bank finance put into this because if I understood it correctly, the financing side, as far uh, as Chinese institutions are, are concerned, these are concentrated in the developing banks they have. And the other important point is they have a lot of uh, financial institutions on the regional level in the provinces, which are to some extent from a financial stability standpoint uh, critical. But what they do is they use these financial institutions at the provincial level uh, for steering infrastructure investment and uh, allowing them uh, to leverage in situations where they wanted to have an expansionary impact on their own economy. And many people in China say the Rodan Belt Initiative is also mainly an instrument to uh, bring the investment ratio in China to a higher level because uh, from the normal situation we are used to, uh, this would flatten down a little bit uh, over, the, over the next years. So there is uh, not only this global political interest, uh, but also a very national economic interest uh, of the Chinese authorities in trying to get these things financed also. On Jean-Claude's question, uh, yes, in your interpretation of the question uh, you raised, I agree with you. When you look at the situation, how central banks have entered into this uh, non-conventional situation, then there were different reasons relevant uh, for this. Europe, as you know best, uh, entered later and with uh, smaller volumes because the European situation at the time was dominated by the view this is an American problem and it will probably never spill over to Europe. Turned out to be wrong and then created a lot of uh, European problems of its own. But if you take, for example, uh, Switzerland or Denmark, who entered into negative territory with the interest rates to a larger extent as the euro area, these were for different reasons. These were for reasons uh, coming from the exchange rate uh, uh, challenges they had because of capital inflows and capital, and capital outflows. Japan has created a, a history of its own over many decades now, but I agree with your question in the respect that uh, what we will see is on the one hand, the big central banks in developed countries um, having the same toolkit at hand with many non-conventional instruments they never sought previously, or the Bundesbank, even the Bundesbank has bought uh, government bonds in uh, 1975, but they, uh, it's not in the normal toolkit uh, they use. So the, the standard and the portfolio of the instruments will become very similar, I guess, for all central banks, but to what extent they use, and to what intensity they are willing to use different forms of instrument, this will per, uh, for sure vary also in this new normal we perhaps will see in 10, 20 years, 20 years time. So harmonization on the instruments, but not necessarily in the use of these instruments. Thank you. So 
that's one perspective. <laughs> and I think we have had a very interesting uh, a session. I want to thank very much uh, the speakers, uh, also those who took part in the discussion. And I'm able to transfer this exactly on time uh, to Andreas Ignal.